If we have a civil war, or if we're already in the early stages of some form of a civil war, which side? Let's call them the red, the conservative side, and the blue, the progressive side. Which side would win? One of the big factors in the American Civil War, 1861, 1865, was population. The North had a lot more people, and they had more white people. Now, I'm not saying that having white people was an advantage, but point, my point is that in the South, if you look at the population, Southerners couldn't use their entire population because a big chunk of it was enslaved. About four million people were enslaved. So half of that, you could say manpower. So certainly there were a million men that if they had considered them men, they could have used to fight. So basically, not only did the South have a, a smaller pool of manpower, it had an even smaller percentage of that manpower that was available for the military. And to a great extent, that black population, as it was gradually freed during the course of the Civil War, became an additional source of manpower for the Union, which was one of the main, prominent, important reasons that the Union won, manpower. If there was a Civil War today, it would be pretty evenly divided. If you look at the election, Usually, the Democrats win by a couple million votes. But given the greater scheme of things and the size of the country and the population, it's nothing like the advantage that the North possessed over the South in the American Civil War. So I would say if you look at population between the red and the blue, it's basically a draw. Industry is something else that the Union had in the American Civil War that the South didn't have much of. That's less true today. I mean, most of our industry is located in and around big cities. So in that sense, you would give the advantage of industry to uh, the blue side. But it's nothing like the advantage the North had over the South in the American Civil War. The same is true with, with other factors. One advantage that the Union had in the American Civil War was ports. Most of the large ports in this country, in those days, you know, mostly the East Coast, were north of, from the Chesapeake North. The Southerners didn't have a lot of good ports. New Orleans was a good port, but they quickly lost that. Uh, that would probably be a blue advantage today as well. Most of the cities that they control are also ports. Uh, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Uh, I'm not sure about San Diego. That would be a tougher one for them to get a hold of. But on the whole, ports would, I would say, would, would favor the blue side. Now, that assumes that they maintain control of the Navy and they can keep those ports open, which would, will be another issue I'll talk about as we move along. Another advantage that the North had in the American Civil War was access to food. Now, the problem wasn't so much that the South couldn't feed itself. It, it managed to do that more or less. Most of the problems were related to transportation. They couldn't move the food around as well as they might have. But the North had a great advantage in food production because a lot of the farming land in the South, they were growing things you, know, you can't eat. You can't eat tobacco. You can't eat cotton. Uh, now, a lot of that could be converted during the war and was, but still the, the North had the advantage of food. If there was an American Civil War today, the blue side would be at a distinct disadvantage. Food doesn't come from cities. And if you look at a map of the United States and the blue counties that, that you know, for example, in Pennsylvania, where I'm from, in and around Philadelphia, in and around Pittsburgh, that's not where the farming is. So they had these cities with half a population and a very small percentage of the land, but they don't have any real access to farms outside of maybe areas of California. So they would be at a distinct disadvantage when it comes to agriculture. Another grave disadvantage for uh, the blue side would be energy. You don't produce energy in cities, you consume it. Most of the energy production in this country is in areas that would be controlled by the red side, by the conservatives. You know, Texas, Oklahoma, the oil fields. Even the areas of Pennsylvania where they're fracking are mostly in counties that are red. And this is pretty true of you know, most of the country. So if there was a civil war, these blue cities 
while they would have industry and they would have, you know, huge amounts, huge percentages of the American population, would not have access to food and would not have access to energy. Now, if they could get this into their ports, that's fine. Uh, if somebody's willing to provide them with the food, sell them the food, or give them the food, or whatever. But this, they would be at a distinct disadvantage with regard especially uh, to food and energy in the event of a full-scale civil war. Another area where the blue side would be at a disadvantage would be armed people. John Shy wrote of the American Revolution that the Americans were people numerous and armed. That's true today. But most of those people who are armed aren't, you know, progressives. Now, there's a lot of interesting statistics about gun ownership that are spun one way or the other. It's a country of 350 million people. There are at least 300 million legal guns in the country, probably more because people have been buying guns the last few months. I'm not quite sure how many more, but probably millions more. And then there are all the illegal guns that are floating around the country. There are a lot of people who don't have unregistered weapons. Now, people will tell you, well, that's, that's deceptive because basically these 300 million guns that are owned in this country are owned by 100 million people. So it looks like there's less than a third of the population that's actually armed. And if you look at it that way, it doesn't look as decisive an advantage. But you have to understand when you're talking about weapons and ownership, you're not talking about individual people. There aren't 350 million individual people living in the United States all by themselves. We live in households, and there are between 135 and 140 million households. We'll have a better idea after they do the new census. It could be a little higher than 140, but somewhere in that range. The figures I usually see are 135, 137, something like that, which means there are, on average, two guns per household. And I think that that's the more telling statistic. I mean, I can remember where I used to live in North Carolina. I mean, I had a neighbor of five people in that household. <laughs> they probably had about three guns per person. So if you look at armed households as a percentage of a population, if there's 100 million households with weapons, 100 million households armed, out of 135 million or 140 million households, what you're really looking at is somewhere around, you know, two thirds of the population by households is armed. And if I just think back, you know, in, in an anecdotal matter to where I used to live, I lived in a college town in North Carolina. I mean, of my progressive friends, some of them may have owned guns. If they did, I didn't know about it. If I looked at my neighbors who weren't in university positions, weren't related to the university, worked on their own, and who were generally much more conservative, these people were armed to the teeth. They all, they all were armed. They all had guns. They all hunted. They all did all those things. So if there was, you know, it's a conflict in my little neighborhood where I used to live. I'm sorry, the progressives are dead. And, and I think that that's true pretty much across the country. So I would give the advantage there to the red side. They're going to have the advantage of an armed population. Another thing that's important and interesting to consider is what about various trained, organized armed forces in this country? Let's start with the police departments, police, sheriffs, county sheriffs, uh, uh, state police at those levels, somewhere 800 to 900,000 people. Now, they're all armed. So the question is, which way would the police forces go if there was a civil war? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, every cop's going to go one way or the other. Obviously, they'll split. But, I mean, what would you think? I mean, who, who, what has the progressive side been doing with police forces? over the last several years, going back to the Obama administration, attacking them. They're racists. They're untrained. They're uneducated. They need to be defunded. So, I mean, if you're in law enforcement and, and there's a break between, you know, the red and the blue, which way are you going to go?
you going to go with the blue side, which says you shouldn't be there? Who wants to get rid of you? Wants to disestablish you? Or do you go to the red side? Now, again, I'm not saying that you know all police forces, all security officers armed, are going to go over to the to the would go over to the red side in the event of a civil war. But I'm saying I think you know they'll probably get a good proportion of them. Remember, a lot of these police forces outside the cities are in counties that are red. Another consideration, National Guard units. Which way do they go? They're controlled by the states. Who controls most of the states? The Republicans. So most of the states are red. Most of the governors are red. Slight advantage there for uh, the red side. Uh, Obviously, other states, the, the National Guard, you would expect, would be manned mostly by people from those blue areas and that they would remain loyal to the blue areas. So it was probably going to be, it would be a split with the National Guard, but I think on the whole, it probably will give a slight advantage uh, to the red side in the event of a, you know, full-blown civil war. What about the American military? It's a really tough one. I mean, if you look back at the American Civil War, the Navy, for the most part, remained loyal to the Union. There were some losses of individuals, but all the ships remained with the Federal Navy. There were a couple that had to be burned because they just couldn't get them out in Virginia, uh, which were captured by the Confederates. But I don't know, I could be wrong, but I don't think there was a single U.S. flagged official Navy vessel where the officers and crew went with the Confederacy. I mean, the officers and members who, who wanted to go left and went to the Confederacy, and they helped man what little Confederate Navy they built up. But on a whole, the Navy remained loyal. I don't know what would happen this time. So it's, in a sense, in the last Civil War, the Navy was an advantage for the North. I don't know what would happen. Because part of the problem is, for all the armed forces, is the, I mean, who volunteers? We have a volunteer military. Remember, in the American Civil War, we had a volunteer military. And the Army, for example, there's a high percentage, not among the officers, but among the enlisted men, of uh, immigrants, you know, the Irish, the Germans, the others who had come over. They stay loyal because they were from the North, because the vast bulk of the immigrants who came to this country went North. Now, they went North for two reasons, because that's where the big ports were. That was the main reason. So they got dumped off in American ports. And then they moved along the railroads, which were also mostly in the north, and as they moved west. Also, if you're an immigrant and you want to go somewhere in the United States and you're an unskilled person who doesn't speak English, so you're going to go face a rough start, do you want to do it in the north or do you want to do it in the south where your competition is slave labor? So there were a lot of reasons immigrants went north. And then a lot of them ended up in the U.S. Army and in the U.S. Navy. So that was one of the major factors that those forces remain loyal uh, to the North. Even in the U.S. Army, no entire units that I know of went South. Officers went South, individual soldiers went South, but the units in themselves remain loyal. Today, if you look at who makes up the American military, they're disproportionately from red areas in this country, especially the South and somewhat the Midwest. It's a volunteer force. Who volunteers? Who's more likely to volunteer, say, for officer candidate school? Uh, A guy from uh, Georgia Tech or somebody who went to MIT? Uh, a, a, A woman who went to Harvard or a woman who went to Texas Tech? And it's, a true, it's the same is true with enlistments. I mean, most of the people who enlist tend to be toward the red side. It doesn't mean there aren't any Democrats in the military. Of course there are. You know, there are people who think just like other progressives in the military. But if you consider where the military was in 1861, with so many people being immigrants who were in the North, it's almost the inverse today, where many of the people you know, if you have a crew of a ship or, or a unit, probably a disproportionate number of the people in that unit come from some sort of red state or a red county, at least. That's going to be true. 
So which way is the military going to go? I don't know. I, I really, who knows? But if you look at how it broke the last time and the reasons why it broke the way it did, you could almost apply those same reasons to the military this time and say a lot of it's going to break red. Not all of it. I'm not saying, you know, everybody's going to fight for the red side. But I think, you know, the North would be, or I shouldn't say the North, the blue side, uh, the coastal enclave side, would be at a distinct disadvantage with manpower. And also, not only that, they don't have lots of the same percentage of veterans in their population that they could call upon to fight, or, or officers and, and, and things like that, where you had, you know, in the South, you had all these West Pointers who had come from the various states. And the states in those days were pretty much balanced between North and South. So because you have appointments, you have roughly 50-50, because there are roughly, you know, the slave and free states were pretty evenly divided. That's not true today. Uh, so uh, you know, who knows? But if anything, I, if it's either going to be equal or more likely an advantage of some degree for the red side. Another disadvantage that I think the blue side would have is that this war would start off in a very different way. When the American Civil War started, the sides were contiguous within each group. You have the southern states were lumped together. They all shared common borders. They all formed a whole. And the same was true of the North. In many civil wars that start out, they don't start out that way. They end up that way. You know, the, the one side will take this area. The other side takes the other area. And eventually, they, they look, you know, you can color them in on a map. This is the red side, and this is the blue side, and they're here, and there's a border here, and this is where they do their fighting. That would likely happen eventually in a civil war here. But the problem that the blue side has is they're in these enclaves in the Northeast, you know, a few spots in the Midwest. And, you, know, you can look at a map and you can see they're surrounded, these blue spots, which have half the population of the country, a little slightly more than half, are surrounded by these red areas. And it would be a real struggle for them because they're initially going to be besieged. They're going to be like the British in Boston. I mean, the British had the best army on the North American continent when the American Revolution broke out. There they were in Boston, but they were surrounded by all these militia units that came in, and eventually they were besieged and forced to retreat up to Halifax. General Howe had to get them out, and Boston fell. And the same thing would be happening to these blue urban areas. They would be surrounded by militia units, former police, state police, sheriffs, National Guard units, perhaps, uh, military units that went over to the other side. And one of, in the early stage of any kind of civil war, these blue little islands are going to have to find a way to connect to one another. I mean, it's easy enough in the, you know, along the California coast and in the area, for, say, from Washington, D.C. up to Boston. That wouldn't be that difficult. It's they're almost a, a natural conurbation where they run one into the other. But the ones in the Midwest are going to be at a real disadvantage, or, or cities like Atlanta, you know, surrounding a sea of red, or, or Austin in the middle of Texas and Houston. I mean, these cities aren't, aren't likely to hold out very long, considering they won't have any energy coming in that's going to get cut off, and they won't have any food. And, you know, in, in the case of inland cities, Austin, lesser extent Houston, I mean, they're really going to have a difficult time supplying themselves. They've got all these people. That's an advantage. But all these people have to be fed. They have maybe an advantage in industry. But without energy, you know, they can't run it. So they're going to be at a distinct disadvantage. And if there was a civil war breaking out, they eventually have to find ways to connect. The people on the East Coast have to connect with the people in the Midwest, and then ultimately with people on the West Coast if they're going to hold out and win. And that's, that's going to be a real strain, especially if they don't control the Navy and they can't keep their ports open and get supplies in from the outside. You know, it's fine if New York City can bring in fuel and... and uh, I, I, I hope 
it would be, I could see a civil war going on, progressive saying, no, we don't want to use oil. You know, we only want wind farms and solar. I, you know, I mean, they're going to have a real problem getting over their intellectual baggage if they intend to hope and win, uh, to, to hold out and win a civil war because they're going to need oil. They're going to need fossil fuels. You know, they're going to have to bring these things in and they're going to have to bring them in by ship. And if they can't get them in by ship, if they also lose control of uh, the naval forces or the naval forces split and, and uh, the red forces can contest entry into the Chesapeake, into the Delaware, into the, uh, the Hudson Basin, you know, they're finished. So the geography of a civil war is a huge advantage for the red side because of the way they're positioned. If you look at a map, the red areas of the country are, for the most part, contiguous. It's the blue areas that are these little islands that are holding out here and there. And they would be at a distinct disadvantage. Whereas in the first civil war, the, the federal side was itself contiguous and much larger. You know, it was this, this big blue area that surrounded the red area, which was the south. So again, if you look at geography, again, I'd give the advantage uh, to the red side. Overall, then, I would say that if it came to it, God forbid if it does, but if we get to that point where we have a full-scale civil war, the advantages will lie with the red team, the conservatives the Republicans, if you want to look at it that way. Now, that doesn't mean they're destined to win. I mean, I don't even think in the Civil War, when I teach the Civil War in my course, I say that the North had a lot of advantages. But that didn't guarantee victory. Nothing guarantees victory except winning victories. I mean, who thought the Americans could beat the British in 1776? Who, who thought the Vietnamese could defeat the United States in Indochina. But they did. Strange things happen, especially in civil wars. You look at the Russian Civil War and how it began, you had a similar situation where these red cities were controlled by these white areas, uh, the, the uh, conservative areas. The problem, though, there is the whole country was on its back because of the, the, the Great War. They had lost control of the army, which went over to the Reds. They had lost control of the railroads, which were in the hands of the Reds through the unions. So that even though the Reds were at all these, dis at all these disadvantages geographically, you could say, they had the advantage of communications and they had uh, the Navy was on their side. They controlled the railroads. They had the unions. And to the extent that army units were still loyal to anybody, they were loyal to them. For the most part, that's why they were able to connect their, you know, connect uh, Petrograd and Moscow, and then to the other cities, and eventually work their way and ultimately secure the entire country. It's going to be a much harder job if if we had a civil war here for the Blues to be able to pull that off. So I think, you know, again, you have an advantage to the red team, but it doesn't guarantee an outcome. You know, a lot will depend on leadership. You know, who's leading the blue team? Who's leading the red team? I mean, you can imagine if you could have had somebody with the uh, uh, abilities, leadership abilities of Abraham Lincoln leading the Confederacy and the leadership incapacity of Jefferson Davis leaving the Union. I'm convinced the South would have won the Civil War. They would have done it because a lot of it depended on leadership. I mean, the South had one great general, Robert E. Lee, but they had a lot of idiots who were just terrible commanders. Union had a lot of terrible commanders, but they had some very good commanders too. Grant, Sherman, Ferson, some others who, who come to mind. So a lot's going to depend on leadership, military leadership. And again, I, I would suspect that you're going to see more of that on the red team and a blue team in the event of a civil war. But there's no guarantees there. One other factor I haven't discussed would be nuclear weapons. And this is a tough one. I mean, you know, the East Coast, you could think, well, probably most of the nuclear submarines would end up with the red side. 
West Coast nuclear submarines probably might end up with the blue side. I don't know. And then you got all those missiles sitting around in the middle of the country, which are mostly in red country, the land-based missiles and, and strategic air command and things like that are in Nebraska and Oklahoma and other places. So it's hard to say. But the, again, if it gets to that point where, you know, the two sides are nuking each other in the middle of a civil war. Uh, you know, I, I wrote something in a book once where, you know, if you want to, you want to play out the scenario nuclear, you know, uh, soak, soak the book with lighter fluid and hit it with a match. I mean, that's basically it. So I won't even talk about advantages there because if it, if it gets to that point, it's not going to matter. So what do you think about all this? I think this is, uh, I mean, it's only speculation. I'm not predicting a full-scale civil war. We're already in, I think, a low-level civil war, and hopefully it won't get any worse. But, you know, I've been arguing that we're headed toward a civil war for over three years now, almost four. And nothing that's happened has caused me to sit back and say, oh, you know, Mike, you made a big mistake. It just looks like it's, you know, continual process toward a breakdown of consensus in this country, which will ultimately lead to a full-scale civil war if it's not arrested. But what do you think? Let me know in a comment. If you like this video, got something out of it, found it useful, give it a thumbs up. Share it with your friends. Push it out there. Uh, hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Uh, subscribe to the channel. That's always good. And until the next time, Keep fighting.